Last week, we studied in a very general sense the topic of greed. However, this week, our examination will be more specific. Greed of any kind is awful, but the kind of greed we are looking at today is most heinous. When someone sins against you, it hurts. But if someone in the church sins against you, that makes the situation more painful. We expect fellow Christians to be people who live according to a higher standard, a higher standard than the world. And we expect them to be people who love us and care about us. And the same goes for greed. We expect the world to be greedy. We expect the lost to do anything for a buck. But when greed leads a professed Christian to steal from the church, it always seems to shock us. Now you might say, how often does something like that happen? Well, you might be surprised to find out that something like this occurs relatively frequently. A survey conducted by Lifeway Research in 2017 surveyed a thousand Protestant pastors and asked if their church had at any point been a victim to embezzlement, whether it was during the time that they were a pastor at that church or before. Shockingly, nearly one in ten churches, or 9%, had been victims of embezzlement at one point. Nearly 10% of churches had had someone in them fall victim to greed and turn to theft, according to this study. Other than evidence one can gather from research, the Bible gives us stern warnings against money-hungry teachers in the church and also warns us as individuals not to devote our lives to the, to the pursuit of money. So if we care about the purity of the church and we don't want to see her fall victim to the greedy, this text should be of interest to you. This is because our text will give us three pictures of what greed looks like so that we can both spot a greedy leader in the church and so that we might be freed from greed as well. Our text has three scenes. Each one of these scenes give us a glimpse of how greed shows up. All three situations take place at different times, and all of them occur just before Jesus is crucified. If you remember, Jesus had just finished the Olivet Discourse at the end of Matthew 25, and as Matthew 26 opens, we read this. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days of the Passover is coming, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. As we have studied the Gospel of Matthew, we have seen the religious leaders of that time clash with Jesus. The tension was high in Matthew 23 when Jesus sharply rebuked them. Now, the religious leaders are so fed up, they are ready to kill Jesus. Certainly, this isn't the first time that they've tried to plot against him. In this section, you will note that Christ tells his disciples that he will soon be killed in a matter of days, and of course, he's right. The chief priests and the elders were wanting to kill Jesus. They wanted to do this by stealth, our text notes. But there's one stipulation in their plan. One thing that they agree not to do, and what is that? They will not do it during the feast, because they did not want to upset the people. What people, you might ask? And what feast? Well, during the Passover feast, hundreds of thousands of Jews would flock to the city, and the leaders did not want to offend them. One commentary puts it like this, The great danger at the time of Passover, when the people, numbering hundreds of thousands, filled the city and encamped in tents outside the walls like a vast army. Now, if Jesus was really this kind of menace, that needed to be dealt with, the leaders should have just performed their duties and had no fear of the people. However, people-pleasing is one way that greediness
this shows itself. There are many teachers out there today that only say what people want to hear. People flock to these kinds of teachers. But God's word has warned us about this. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. You see this in a lot of ministries. Everything is comfortable. Every message is easygoing. Sermons don't have any bite to them. Preaching has no teeth. Sin is never addressed. But why? Well, it's rather simple. If churches never teach the hard truths of Scripture, nobody gets offended. And if nobody gets offended, nobody leaves. And if nobody leaves, you end up with a huge congregation filled with donors. But a church that is zealous for God, and not money, will be willing to have those hard conversations. The pastor will be willing to offend people, not by being crass or rude, but with the truth. Another way that people-pleasing in the church shows up is when there is a lack of accountability. Nobody is privately rebuked for sin. Church membership is not practiced, nor is church discipline. A church that is willing to lose people because they follow the biblical practice of church discipline, even if those people are huge donators, is a church that is focused on pleasing God and not man. What's the takeaway from this first section? The religious leaders were willing to kill Jesus, which spoke to their wickedness, of course. But I'm sure in their minds, they were doing God a favor. They were willing to do what they thought God wanted, if and only if doing so did not upset the people. They had no problem following God, but only if it was acceptable to the people. This is totally wrong. We need to prioritize God and not man. We should be willing to oppose people, if and only if, it is pleasing to God. Not the other way around. If someone is in sin, we should lovingly rebuke them. Will this be uncomfortable? Yes. Will people dislike you for doing that? Maybe. But do you care more about pleasing God or pleasing man? Will you do what is right, even if crowds of people might hate you? Real ministry is difficult, and I fear that some of you may not be willing to have those hard conversations. May the Lord convict us of this, if that is the case. Our second section reads as follows. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And isn't that true? We're reading that right now. But for context, we need to also check out John's gospel. This is because John gives us more details about this event. Let me read you a bit from John 12. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, whom he was about to betray, excuse me, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So here's Mary. She's doing what Christ called a beautiful thing. She anoints him with ointment that costs nearly a year's wages, or 300 denarii. Interestingly enough, this is when Christ was anointed for burial. 
Not after his death, but before his death. Luke tells us that there is no time to prepare Christ's body for burial. Luke 23 says this about Christ's body after the crucifixion. Then he, Joseph of Arimathea, took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid it in a tomb cut in stone, where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. You see, they were going to the tomb on Sunday with the spices, but the tomb was empty. They never got to prepare his body for death. So here is Mary on the Tuesday before Jesus dies, pouring out this very nice ointment onto Jesus. I'm sure that she didn't understand the symbolism of what she was doing, but rather she's doing this out of love for Jesus. This was a very nice thing to do. But not everyone is okay with this. We learn a lot about Judas in this passage as John's account says that he objected. We learn that Judas was in charge of the group's money bag. We learn that he stole from the money bag. We also learn that Judas was objecting to what Mary was doing, not because he actually cared about the poor. He didn't. He just wanted to keep the money for himself. Oh, you should have put the money in the bag. We could have gave it to the poor. Wink, wink. Judas did not want to give any money to the cause, to, to any cause that didn't directly benefit him. He didn't care about the poor. He was upset that money was spent on Jesus instead of going into his pocket. He was a victim of self-centered spending or a self-serving way of handling money. How often, brothers and sisters, do we see churches spend money on extravagant purchases that have nothing to do with Jesus? I remember a few years ago, a church here in town pretended to fire their pastor out of a cannon to promote some event that they were having. It wasn't really their pastor. It was a dummy, but it was made to look like their pastor. Certainly, we can look at purchases and expenses like that and ask, was that really a proper use of church funds? We can look at churches that employ pastors with large salaries who do little actual work for the kingdom of God and question their spending. But how often do we consider our own spending? How often do we question our own purchases and contributions? Our money is God's money, and so we should spend it on things that glorify God. Corporately, churches are to aid the poor, pay gospel-focused ministers, and should shoulder the cost of missions work. But you as an individual should also consider your spending. Consider your contributions. And ask yourself if you are self-centered in your spending. It's very easy to get excited about a big purchase that caters to our desires. A new TV, a nice piece of clothing, or something along those lines. But how often do we get excited about giving money for ministry purposes? We need to ask God to reveal our hidden faults in this area, if any, and consider the words of Acts 20, verse 35, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Finally, as we come to our third picture of greed in Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16, we read this. Then one of the twelve his name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Here we see Judas conspiring with the religious leaders to kill Jesus. What was his motivation? Why did he want to commit the worst act of betrayal in human history? He was greedy. He wanted those thirty little pieces of silver. He valued those 30 coins more than he valued the Lord Jesus Christ. The third point is this. Greed will lead to a variety of other sins. This makes greed very dangerous. Take Judas, for example. The greed of Judas led him to steal money from the group. His greed led to deceit 
as he betrayed Jesus. And Judas helped in the murder of Jesus because he was greedy. Greed is the fuel that maintains some so-called churches and their leaders. These teachers' desire for money will lead them to do anything, even swindle the church out of her money. The Bible warns us about these kinds of people. 2 Peter 2.3 says, In their greed they will exploit you with false words. 1 Timothy 6.9 tells us about the greed of false teachers and how their greed affects others. It says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You see, greed caused these leaders to deceive their listeners. Greed leads to many sins. This is why the next verse, 1 Timothy 6, says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. This isn't just a warning for people who are leaders. It is a warning for us as well. If we prioritize money, it will manifest itself in noticeable ways and will be a detriment to your spiritual life. I remember a number of years ago when I was still working in restaurants, just barely getting by, working long hours in the hospitality industry. I was faced with an exciting opportunity. A bartender who had left our restaurant contacted me. Funny enough, through our work phone, he called me while I was working from this other restaurant to tell me that he was looking for a manager at the restaurant he had just moved to. I was excited. I thought this was my big break. I then asked him about the hours and the days I was supposed to work. It turns out that I was supposed to work on Sunday, and specifically Sunday morning. And I had to turn down the job. Even though that could have been a great opportunity for my career, I was not willing to violate the, the principles that I saw in Scripture. In the past, I had done so. I had given in to the pressure and compromise. I worked on Sunday. I missed church. And I had cared more about my job than my church and my Lord. With a few exceptions, the Reformed view is that working on Sunday is a violation of the Fourth Commandment. And it profanes what is called the Christian Sabbath. If you'll allow me, I'll read from our confession, a modernized version, that is, on this subject. The Sabbath is to be kept holy to the Lord when people have first prepared their hearts appropriately and arranged their everyday affairs in advance. Then they observe a holy rest all day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their secular employment and recreation. Not only that, but they also fill the whole time with public and private acts of worship and the duties of necessity and mercy. Again, there's a few exceptions to that laid out in the confession. But, in many cases, missing church in, pursuit, in the pursuit of money is just an example of how greed causes us to compromise. Greed can lead to coveting or the desire to have what someone else has. Coveting is such a big issue that it was the focus of the Tenth Commandment. Last week we said that greed is idolatry. One could make the argument that greed is also a violation of the First Commandment then, not to have any other gods besides the true God. Judas was responsible for the murder of Jesus. He did this because he was greedy, as we've said already, that would have been a violation of the fifth commandment. You see how I'm going through the list of commandments and how all those violations can be linked to greed. I could go on, but I hope that you are convinced that greed is a great danger, one that we really need to be careful about as it leads to many other sins. Now we have seen that greed shows up in many ways, not only specifically in people pleasing and selfish spending, but greed can cause many other sins. We can look at this on a corporate level, that is, looking at greed in local congregations and in churches on a whole, but we can also look at it from an individual level. So what's the application? The application is this, and it's a simple one. Look to Jesus. Just about any time we see a Christian virtue that we are to live out, we can see it best in Jesus. Christ is not greedy. He has never been greedy, and he never will be. 
Let's go back through some of our points and examine Jesus. Is Jesus a people pleaser? Is he a compromiser? No. If he was, he would not have been killed. He sharply rebuked those who were in the wrong, and he didn't care what people thought about him when he ate with the despised tax collectors and prostitutes. We should be like that. We should do what is right, even if it costs us our reputation or the prospect of more money. Second, Christ was not only concerned about his well-being. In fact, he cared about us. He loved us. He showed us the greatest act of generosity in history by dying for us. So generous and so loving was this act that it is the standard by which we know what love is. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Why was this act so important? Because we all need a Savior. All of us have been guilty of greed. We need our sins, both sins of greed and other sins, to be pardoned. Christ provides for us the only payment for sin which is acceptable to God. We must turn to Him in faith, throw away our old lives, and believe in the gospel. This is the only way we can be forgiven. And for those of us who have been pardoned, we are now called to live for the sake of Christ. Let us throw away every ounce of greed that weighs us down, and by God's help, live more and more for the glory of the one who saved us. When faced with the temptation of compromise, when Satan tries to pull us away from integrity, let us walk in our master's footsteps and put away our self-serving desires. Let us look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God.